the music you're doing, I mean, even though it seems like you kind of hop between R&B and dance, it seems like, at least at this time in your career, you're known for your dance anthems. And, uh, I mean, the dance crowd is a bit different than the R&B crowd. Right, right. You know, you have the gay community, you have the, tr the trans community, you know, you have the queer community and everything else like that. How was that when that community really started to embrace you and really kind of, you know, become your main audience in a way? Man, I appreciate it. I appreciate that people still to this day from the 90s still come out and see CC Peniston and still support me and still love me and just say, hey, you know what? When I got married, I played your song here. When my baby was born, your song was played there. So it's like I get so many different stories from people. Um, and, you know, it's kind of an overwhelming feeling because you don't really know how it touches people. But when they tell you, you're like, okay, damn, all right, I appreciate that. You know what I mean? So it's like I get a new audience all the time. Like recently I did some jazz music. I've been doing some gospel. I was, you know, doing gospel when I was, like I said, 13 years old. Um, I've done some EDM. So I have like so many different little audiences, you know? Uh, okay, so you dropped two number one singles on the dance charts. Mm -hmm. uh, you end up going on a big tour uh, with... Joe, Cover Girls, Lavert, and R. Kelly. Right. Uh, this was what year? This was 92? 1994. 94. Okay. Yep. Got it. So what was it like to be on tour with R. Kelly in 94? How about what is it like to just be on tour? The shit is, <laughs> the shit is freaking stressful. <laughs> shit. You don't sleep. Like, you don't sleep. You get into a city. You may have an interview to do. Like, you lay out your clothes, you're getting hair and makeup done, right? The show starts at 8 o'clock. Like, we used to lay out our clothes and pack shit before we even went on stage because we knew, don't try to pack after the show. All you got to do is have your shit ready and get on the tour bus. That was it. Because, you know, it was just like you have four acts that are sound checking. Look, R. Kelly was the biggest at the time, right? So you know he's going to take up most of the sound check time, right? You're going to get 10 minutes, if that to even make sure your sound is right. Whoever is the headliner is taking up at least an hour or so. And then they leave like 30 minutes for everybody else. So as long as you're cool with that and know, hey, this is the time that you're gonna get, that's what you're gonna get. Right, because that was, uh, I guess when 12 Play was coming out uh, around that time. Yeah, I mean, he was still with, with public announcement, I think, right? Absolutely, and people was loving yeah. him at that time. Yeah, yeah, no, I mean, R. R. Kelly is a beast. Uh, did you guys form a relationship at all? You know what? I, I can't even say I really know him like that. To be honest with you, it was like we was, you know how you're on tour with somebody, you see them at sound check, you see them at show, but you don't see them after that? Like it was never no hangout time or anything like that. But at the time he was performing, I respected his gift, his music at the time. So it was like one of those things. But no, I can't say I know him like that. I mean, when you fast forward to 2021 and you see where he is right now, I mean, in prison for the past year and a half or, or something like that, um, as someone that sort of saw him as he was ascending to his height and you see the talent level and you see kind of where life has brought him, what are your thoughts on it? That's on him. Mm. Yeah. I really can't say too much because that's on him. It is what it is. Okay, so... Then there's a third single off that album, Keep On Walking. Yes. And that went number one on the, the dance charts again. <laughs> Yo, when I tell you I was so surprised but happy at the same time. So let me tell you another funny story. So we're listening to music, right? My manager at the time was Damon Jones, right? And um, we, we had, we had the, the, the cassettes we were listening to at the time, right? And it was like, Yo, see, I think we missed something. I was like... How could we have missed anything? He was like, no, for real, we missed something. Because we had Love Thing, and we had Finally. And I was like, he was like, yo, listen to this. It was like, boom. I was like, oh, shit. I was like, hey, wait a minute. I said, call them tomorrow. I said, tell them we want that song. And the thing I loved about that song was I felt like it was women's empowerment. I felt like, oh, this song is going to go. The beat is hot. It's women's empowerment. You know, any chick that broke up with a dude that had like an attitude or woke up on the wrong side of the bed is going to relate to this song. And that's why I loved it. And so I said, let me go ahead. And um, I said, please tell them I want this. And they said, yes. 
There you go. So here you have your debut album, mm -hmm. three big singles. One of those is a huge single. Mm -hmm. uh, how did the album do? It went platinum, multi-platinum? It went, um, it went at the time, five million. And that was the last left. That was, so five million records sold was probably about like eight, 10 years ago. So I'm, I, I looked recently, I'm thinking we're at eight to 10. But you know, they don't ever want to update and give you another gold album. You know how it goes. Okay. So essentially, it's a diamond album. I feel like it is because I'm going to tell you, Vlad, like, and I'm not being funny, but I feel like, like clockwork finally is done like every year. Like it's been done jazz, EDM. Like I can, I can name you, there's like 10,000 bodies of work that include finally, some of which is even last year, Chris Brown and Joyner Lucas with the song finally, with the melody of finally, with the song called finally, Travis Scott. And you know, amongst a few others, and then they had a jazz version with like a stand-up bass, and I was like, "Oh, I'm about to take that for my own show on something I do, right?" So it was cool. Yep. Uh, this is the power of having publishing. Period. This right. Is, this this is why you <laughs> want to own your publishing right here. This this conversation <laughs> we're having right now. Right. Uh, so I mean, record record deals are kind of funny, especially when it comes to new artists. Uh, so as this thing is going multi-platinum, is the money starting to really pour in between the record sales and the tour money? Or is it kind of like, uh, wait until the sophomore album to really get paid? No, I was actually a millionaire eight months in. Wow. Okay. And that was the amazing thing. It was like, I was actually a millionaire eight months in. Um, I was home for probably maybe three weeks. I'm sorry, eight months in, I was a millionaire, right? I was home for three weeks. Um out of the whole year after I counted everything, right? And it's funny thing, so this is funny as well. I was living in um, an apartment, I'm a millionaire, but I hadn't been in the music business. So I said, you know what? I don't wanna move yet because I'm not sure how long this is gonna last, right? And I'm like, my friends are like, quit being stupid, just move, you already got it. Like, why are you tripping, right? And so I went, I went ahead and moved and got me a house and everything, right? Um, but I think that it was after that where the pressure comes. Okay, and I mean, when you come from humble backgrounds and you have a group of friends, you have family and everything else like that, and I mean, I've had it happen to me, pretty much everyone I talk to has had it happen to them. People start to change, people start to expect certain things. A lot of friction starts to happen when you're the one that becomes the millionaire. Uh, did you go through that? Yeah. Definitely. I had people that feel like, hey, you work for me, like you didn't give me enough. I'm like, wait a minute. But I blessed 30 other people with the same thing I blessed you with. Boom. Right. Or um, it was, hey, you're making this. I'm like, hey, quit counting my money. It doesn't pertain to you. I don't mind giving. But however, I think you're expecting X, Y and Z because I'm a giver and I've learned that I have to put a boundary on the stuff that I that I give because Sometimes people overthink what I should be giving them. And I'm like, wait a minute. First of all, I'm giving you X, Y, and Z. Have you treated me to a trip or to dinner or to whatever? So I'm not trying to be funny style, but um, just saying. Yeah, I feel you. I definitely feel you. Uh, so you come off this, this monster debut album, and then within a year, they want you to work on your next album. Right while you're touring and, and promoting and doing everything else. Did you feel like you were kind of rushed back in the studio or were you ready to just, okay, next album? No, it, it wasn't a rush, it was life happening. It was, life was, I was going through a divorce at the time. Um, hey, make another finally. Hey, do this, this and that. And I think that when you try to put the artist in a box, right? Um, I think that's where the, the pressure happens or the weird part happens, it's like, look, just let me create. Because you'll probably find everything that you really want if you just let me create. And I think when you have to measure up to this part, I think that's where the problem happens. And people just don't realize that. And I guess at the time, you can correct me if I'm wrong, did you feel like you were being kind of pigeonholed into the, the dance genre and you want to do more R&B? Or were you kind of happy being in that kind of lane 
considering how big you got in it. To be honest with you, I feel like people's thought is their thought. I'm like, I gave you R&B, ballads, dance, all in one album. So why are you pigeonholing me? Because I gave you finally Keep On Walking. I, I gave you finally dance. We Got a Love Thing, dance. Keep On Walking, R&B. Inside I Cried, R&B, but slow, ballad, right? And then mid-tempo, I gave you Crazy Love. So I was confused when people put me in a box and I'm like, excuse me, I gave you, I gave you everything on one in the first place. So why do you have a problem with me doing something different? It was more their problem than mine. Right, but finally kind of overshadowed all those songs in a way. So you kind of became, you know, that song almost became the trademark for you. So, you know, from a business level, I could see how they were just trying to create another finally. <laughs> but you know, two. but you know why? they shouldn't have had a problem with it because without me, everybody else did it different. We had R&B, we had EDM, we had jazz, we had, look, instrumentals that included finally, we had hip hop. Even if I didn't do it, you're still making money off the body of work that I did because guess what? The other people that did it, did it in so many different ways that it shouldn't have been a complaint to me, but I can understand that I started a trend, right? So you're saying, well, why don't you do another one? And I'm saying, okay, well, help me do another one. Help me win. So if you want me to win, here's this producer here is the hottest producer in 1994 or 95, whoever that may be, right? Have them do a different version of Finally that's like right now. Am I wrong? Mm -hmm. Okay. so. Don't rely on me to give you 1991 and 1995 when there's different producers in 1995 who can give you a different mix of finally that relates to the BPMs of 1994 or five. Okay, so the second album comes out and I'm in the mood goes number one on the dance charts. Mm -hmm. So that's your fourth number one. Right. Um, but overall, it doesn't, you know, kind of match the heights of the debut album. Is that a, a correct statement in terms of sales wise and everything? You know, they have their thought and I have mine, right? Oh, okay. I was, I was doing something. So put it like this. I did. So to be fair, cause I'm the commodity, right? For a &M, right? Mm -hmm. I didn't do as much dance on the third album as the first album. Correct. Right. I was trying some different things. They may have, they may not have liked it. I did, right? But they're the one who is saying, hey, we're giving you the budget, right? And so if we're giving you the budget, we want you to do what we want you to do. And so mistake on my end for not understanding that sometimes, and I learned this later because I became the record company and I became the person that became responsible for all the bills. So guess what? I understood later, but not in that moment. Why can't I just do what I want to do? Because it costs money, that's why, right? Mm -hmm. And they're getting an attitude because they're like, hey, we're trying to put this, 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 and this out. And as an artist, it's like, hey, when you're responsible for all the photo shoot, blah, 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 graphics, mastering, et cetera, that shit is expensive. So kudos, and I understand what they meant at the time, but I learned it later. Well, then, I'm Not Over You, that's the next big single. And uh, it, it hits number two on the dance charts. So almost number one, but definitely another strong single. Mm -hmm. um, what happened next after that? I still kept doing songs. If people look, um, I worked with the EC Twins. I worked with Ron Carroll. I worked with Steve Hurley. I had He Loves Me Too, Nobody Else. I had Hot. I worked with um, 480 East out of um, Canada. Are You Ready? Like, I was still moving. It's just, I think, what people chose to look for with me. I didn't stop. However, we had a transition from when social media was really popping, right, to... Like, like, see, there was a lapse between when social media was really popping and when it really came into effect, correct? Mm -hmm. 
So mm -hmm. people didn't know how to find me or look for me. And to be honest with you, I didn't know how the hell to post. I'm posting posts, right? And I'll put it on there, look, half head cut off or whatever and stupid shit, right? Where people are like, yo, take that shit down. You don't have hashtags that look right, et cetera, right? So they're laughing at me, but and I think it's funny because it's just a, um, a learning lesson for me and a tool, right? And so um, what I can say now is I'm almost at 100,000. People can find me now, but then it was just like a learning thing for me. I'm like, well, why do we have to post on social media? And it's like, hey, that's the tool where people find you. They understand what you're doing. And I realized, okay, let me pull it back, okay? So the pullback is when I came back in the 90s, right? The 90s was be a mystery. It was don't let people know who you are. It was have a publicist. It was don't give too much of your private life away. Okay, boom, social media hits. Social media says, hey, um, we want to know about your personal life. We want to know what you eat every day. Why aren't you posting? You disappeared. And where can we find you? Because we don't know how to find you. And are you personable at the same time? And I think that was my win-win because people have told me, you know, you real cool people and you know what, we didn't think you were answering the DMs. I said, no, I do. <laughs> so it takes me a minute sometimes, right, to get back to people. But I think that has been my thing to keep me in the current part right now.